Okay, so um, I guess uh, many of you know of Luciano's work and so on, as you should do. Um, I know Luciano quite well. It's well known in our field that we uh, hate each other. Um, there's a lot of shouting going on usually when we meet. That's right. Uh, but that's the official side of things. That's why everybody's here today. <laughs> yeah, exactly, so people think we're going to shout. But then we usually go for dinner and we, we, we're friends. So that's a sign that we don't show in public. Right? So I'm not going to shout anything. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Uh, maybe. Depends on what you say. I'm going to talk out the dinner for later. So okay. good luck. Good. Enjoy. Well, you know, the real title is what Luciano can do and what Niels can't do. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. Well, the title is what Luciano knows and what he doesn't know, but the rest of us now after two years. <laughs> no, for sure. Okay, so, well, thank you very much to Lars and Niels for embodying <laughs> <laughs> um, That shows how much he cares. Um, so, um, what I'll be talking about is, well, it's written on the title, in the title, and um, I guess when Lars and Niels have been thinking about it, the title, uh, they really thought that Beyond was referring to me, because I'm so much beyond all of this that I don't even have a cross. But um, I I'll try to explain that maybe this is not such a bad idea. So here's what I'll, I'll, I'll talk about. First of all, <coughs> I'll make two philosophical preludes, and then I'll, I'll tell you about what I believe is robust in the spiral and merger of binary neutron stars. So BNS stands for binary neutron stars. And I look at equal mass, unequal mass, no magnetic field, equal mass, magnetic field. Then I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something about what is problematic in this, in this line of work. What is uh, in our future work planning, but at the time, something which instead I will not dis present, but if you want I can discuss about it, is the dynamics of mixed binary, so when you have a neutron star and a black hole, and the implication of what are we doing for gamma ray versus physics. So let me start with my philosophical prelude number one. <coughs> so I guess we all agree that numerical solutions are the only possible ones in regimes where perturbative techniques or simplified hypotheses, say certain symmetries, cannot be used. Okay? So, if we agree on that, let, let me ask you then a simple question. Um, this is a set of equations I usually have to solve. Uh, this is the only slide having equations. But, so, I have to solve the full answer in the equation. So, you have the answer in tensor here, and you have the session in tensor on the other side. I have to conserve energy and momentum. I have to conserve baryon number. I need a prescription for the equation of state. If I have uh, electromagnetic fields, I will also need to solve Maxwell equations, which essentially in the MHD, ideal MHD limit, we re re reduce to having an induction equation and then zero divergence. And then I have this stress energy tensor, which is <coughs> just a linear composition of whatever I can put in in my physical description. So the question is what is the difference between a numerical calculation and a numerical simulation? Um, this is a question sometimes asked to my colleagues who do numerical work, and sometimes they don't even know the answer. So let me try to <coughs> underline what is the very important difference. Suppose that we have t mu nu equal to zero, so we are in vacuum. Okay? In that case, the physical and mathematical setup are complete. In the case of black holes, this is the only complete theory we have in theoretical physics. And the reason for this is that black holes are so simple. They are macroscopical objects, but they are described by just three quantities. It doesn't get any simpler than that. So you have all the complications of Einstein's equations, but the theory is complete. So when I do a calculate, when I do quantum gravity, well, th th that's not the GR. I mean, it's it's <laughs> classical relativity. Okay. So and, uh, you know, skipping aside from quantum gravity, the theory there is complete. So when I do a calculation. My only error is a numerical one. It's really a calculation. It's, there is no ambiguity. On the other hand, as soon as I start having t mu nu different from zero, the physical description and the mathematical setup are incomplete. <coughs> In that case, we perform simulations. In this case, the numerical error is, only, is the only measurable error. I have no idea when I do something whether this is, has got anything to do with reality. So, what I will talk 
to you about today are simulations. So this is my approximation to reality. And I, I don't pretend that this is you know, real physics or astrophysics. This is just- you uh, have talked to, uh, say, an Uber physicist. Yes. Wouldn't he have defined the two in exactly the opposite order, saying uh, that well, he knew knew is the only part I understand? Well, but, but it's still, it's, it's not complete. I mean, he has an understanding of it, but it's not complete. I mean, he still has parts of it which are not well defined. In, in Einstein's theory, that, that's not the case. The only exception in, in Einstein's theory is maybe the initial data. You may decide, well, I have a binary system of black holes. What are the realistic masses or uh, momentum? And then you can say, well, I expect them to be in circular orbits at a given separation and so on. But that's the only ambiguity. Otherwise, everything is you know, well defined. So this is my approximation to reality. And it's the approximation to the extent at which I know how to apply this guy. And I express its conservation. <coughs> And I mean, have the sec second philosophical prelude. <clears throat> there are, my approximation of reality is still very crude, but it can be improved. You know, I have a well-defined path in which I can make this more realistic. I can put realistic equation of state, I can put magnetic fields, I can put viscosity, radiation transport, you name it. Um, then I ask myself, does this really increase my understanding of the physics I try to simulate? If I just put in more and more microphysics, do I really understand? Or I just will have an answer which is more complex to interpret. And um, because I don't think that this route is all necessarily uh, giving you insight, I will provide evidence that even in acute approximations, so talking about polytropes, um, and some people here don't like to hear polytropes, but even if you have something as simple as polytropes, there are aspects that are far from being understood. And it is because we're dealing with an Einstein theory and other dynamics. Both of them are nonlinear th non um, theories. And when they are together, you end up usually with a, in something which is quite complex. OK, so <clears throat> what is it that we do? Um, these are our strengths, essentially, <clears throat> what we can do in terms of our numerical techniques. And we go quickly through it. We have I order, up to eighth order, finite difference techniques for the field equations. We use flux conservative formulation of the aerodynamic and MHD equations. We use constraint transport and divergence cleaning for the magnetic field. We use high resolution capturing method. So, you know, in, in, in our jargon, this is the best you can do. Then we have wave extraction. Wave extraction is important for us. You know, characterization of the signal in terms of gravitational waves is what we're paid for. We use AMR. We need to have uh, to put resolution there where it's needed. Um, black holes come up all the time, and so we need to know how to measure them. And if sometimes something goes wrong, we, 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 are, we use excision. So this is a technique by which you can remove part of your computational domain if, if singularities appear. What are our weaknesses? <laughs> so, so far in the, in the work that we present today, we're using idealized analytic equation of state. Uh, realistic equation of state are implemented, but uh, this is not what we present. We have a single fluid description, so no superfluid, no crust. Ideal MHD, no resistive effects included, although they work in progress. We use just in viscid fluid so far. We use radiation. Um, we, we neglect radiation and neutrino transport. Um, and so, of course, we can't do any matching with observations. Partly because we don't do neutrino and, 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 and photon transport, and because the other observations, those in gravitational waves, are not like, yet there yet. And, and that's what we always fight for. Um, our resolution is always very coarse. So we are far from regimes where interesting things actually happen. So let me start with um, unmagnetized, so no magnetic field, equal mass binaries. <coughs> um, I have very simple equation of state, but I have two. And this allows me to check or have an, uh, an understanding of what is the influence of different equations of state. So I have what I would call a cold equation of state, which is a polytropic equation of state. This is isentropic. So the internal energy, or if you wish the temperature, increases or decreases only by mechanical work. You take a piece of this fluid, you compress it, you expand it, temperature will change. This, this is the relation between pressure and density, and this is the internal energy, the specific internal energy. Now, there is no fluid on this planet that behaves like a polytropic fluid. So it's really a very crude approximation. But it's good if you are treating something which is extremely cold. And we expand a neutron star, well, when they are in spiraling, they're far from each other, they are 
they are well defined by this. Then the next simplest example is a hot equation of state. It is what I will call ideal fluid. This is non-isentropic. So if I have a shock, I can produce locally entropy. This means that internal energy can increase the, by a shock heating. This is the equation of the state in this case. You see there is a relation between pressure, density, and specific internal energy. And then I also need to solve at the time evolution for the specific internal energy. Hot and cold are here just two extremes of the, of, of the possibilities. And if you wish, a cold is best suited for the spiral, while a hot is essential if you really want to study the merger. Now, I will go briefly through this table, which I prepared um, after attending this meeting, because I felt like I need to, 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 to make sure that um, this is not completely unrealistic. So, this is, here I have on the first row, the time scale, which is the, essentially the aerodynamical order, if you wish, because at the end they are very similar, the gravitational wave emission time scale. And then I have all the other things which are relevant, so the neutrino diffusion time scale, the viscous part, bulk viscosity time scale, magnetic diffusion time scale. And if you compare these numbers, so the spiral will last, will enter, the binary will enter in our detectors something like a day or a few hours before they merge. The merger takes place in about, uh, so when I produce this object, the hyper mass neutron star, between one millisecond and a hundred milliseconds. And this, well, after I produce a black hole passatory, this will last between a millisecond to, I don't know, a few months. Uh, these are the numbers. This is what, 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 the, what sets the physics in this scenario. And all the others are the numbers which come from other, other, other processes. And you see essentially that, that this number is always much smaller than these. And there are some cases where these are comparable, but uh, like for instance here, and that's why we need to study this better, or, or this time here, and this is why we need to do the radiation transport. But in general, the, 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 the level of sophistication that we have now is pretty pretty sufficient to have a qualitative description. If you look at the temperature, you also realize that, you know, maybe I shouldn't worry about superfluidity after all, at least in this stage. Uh, I don't know what is the temperature here because I haven't calculated it at all, not having radiative transfer. And then I, if I ask myself how much, what is the error I'm doing in not putting it across? Well, so this is the, uh, I'm reporting here the ratio between the mass in the cross and the mass in the error. What is the mass in the error? <laughs> 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 any, any number I produce as an error, okay? And, and uh, let's say that if I have a mass 1, my error is maybe 1%, okay? So if I normalize the mass of the class to 1, to the solar mass, say, and then I, I divide this by the mass of the error, you see this is what is the ratio. So up until I will have a machine precision which is comparable with the mass that I'm neglecting in the class, having or not having the class will not make a difference. Okay. Sorry? <laughs> That's right. So, here is an example of what we do. Um, this is an animation, I'm sorry, a number of animations. Um, uh, uh, this is a high mass binary. So, in my animation, I will show two possibilities. I will show what happens when you have different equations of state, and I'll show what happens when you have different masses. And I have just a high mass binary, 1.6 solar masses, and a low mass binary, which is just 1.4 solar masses, so 10% difference roughly in the masses. This one is a polytropic, so this one is a cold equation of state. Um, so this is the grid structure, <coughs> the typical grid structure, you see you have mesh refinement, so that the resolution is, is, is uh, low in, in the distant parts, of, and is high where the neutron stars are. These are the neutron stars which are orbiting. Part of the deformation here is the gauge effect. You know, in numerical relativity, gauges are, are essential, but they also distort uh, things. So you can see that the surfaces, you know, you have tidal waves, which are, which are produced by, by tidal interaction. And then at one point, they, they merge. What's the color scheme? Uh, it's here. So it's 0 to 10 to the 14 grams. And, and then you, you produce an object, but this object is so heavy and doesn't have enough pressure support that it's, it's just doomed to produce a black hole. Of course, some of the matter has too much angular momentum, so it can't get into the black hole at, f at first. So it will hang around, essentially, 
oscillating at a, a exactly frequency up until other dissipatory effects, for instance, gravitational wave emission or viscosity or neutrino emission will decrease the energy in the torus and, and, and then will produce it, its accretion. But what I'm showing you is that essentially we don't have any problem in simulating the whole picture. And, and it is a major, a major promise with respect to a few years ago where people couldn't, couldn't, couldn't get just portions of this, of this picture. Well, it is spherical in the center, not flattened by rotation. It, it, is, it is, it is, it is, it is, you can't quite appreciate it, but it's a 0 0.7 in A over M squared, oh. in, in J over M squared. So it's a spinning black hole, actually quite, quite fast spinning. Um, so let's see, let's interpret what happens. This is the central density normalized with initial time. So imagine you are an observer sitting in the center of the star, and you just measure your local density as a function of time. You will see that there are these little wiggles here, these are the tidal modes which are, uh, which are triggered by, by your companion. Then there is this dip here in the density. That's when you will go towards your other star, and then you will feel a rarefaction. And then you have this exponential blow up. That's when the, the single object then collapses to produce a black hole. Okay, so this is the merger, and this is the collapse of black hole. And then of course the density will, will this is the maximum density, will be just the density of, of the torus. And you can see that, you know, it's a couple of orders of magnitude smaller. So you still have a very dense torus outside the black hole. So that's, that's not at a given point of the gradient, maximum. It's the maximum, yes. So how do we find the black hole when everything is moving? Uh, what do you, you mean? What do you say what is in the horizon? So, so you, can, you can define what is an horizon. Okay, that's a very simple question. You say, I, I shoot photons in all, in all directions. Mm -hmm. I calculate the expansion, so how much they deviate from, from the direction I send them. Mm -hmm. And when this expansion is zero, I define this as the apparent horizon. And now, there is a, a, a lot of theory which tells you that if you have this surface mm -hmm. on a given space like slice, then you can tell what is the mass of the black hole, what is its spin, and so on. So mm -hmm. there is a way of measuring all of these properties by looking at the apparent horizon. So this is uh, what, you, what, what is important. This is the observable, okay? This is the, <coughs> the waveform. And, and because this will be useful in, 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 in later on, um, this is in spiral. You see you have an amplitude which increases, and the frequency also increases. You have a merger, which is a break of this uh, harmonic behavior. Then you have a very large increase, that's the black hole production, and then you have the ring down. Okay? Um, the ring down is a very typical uh, process in black holes. Black holes are, are dynamical, they respond to perturbations just like anything in, in, in this universe. And in particular they have this response which is an exponentially decaying response, and it's called quasi-normal mode ringing, because just like a bell, you hit a black hole and it will ring down. And the, the envelope of this ring down tells you all you need to know about a black hole, you know, its mass, its, its spin, and so on. Okay, um, so this picture is always true. You have a merger, you produce an object which is called hypermassive neutron star. So there's a, a neutron star that can't be produced in nature. Astrophysically, you can't produce it. There's no transition of, of equilibria that leads you to a hypermassive neutron star. But you can, of course, produce in this way, and it's not a stable star, and we produce a black hole plus a torus. So, what I've shown you with the movie is, is always true, but this is qualitatively co correct. You have quantitative differences. You can have differences in the mass for the same equation of state. If you have a smaller mass, then you will produce an HMNS, which is further away from the, from the threshold to black hole collapse, and so will collapse at a later time. At the same time, if you have the same mass, but you now change the equation of state, again, the, 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 this period of time when you have an HMNS will be different, because if you have a star which has a lot of pressure support, then it can find longer against gravity, and, and so it lasts for a longer time. Now, how much in excess of nuclear density was the central region of this hypermassive neutron star? Um, you couldn't see it. Yes, and I don't have an, a precise <coughs> number. But it's it's maybe um, 
well, I don't want to, 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 to say um, you know, incorrect numbers, but I think it's some, something between um, one or a few 10 to the 15 grams per cubic centimeter. And that's the polygram. And that's the polygram, yes. Um, what is the maximum mass of these polygraphs? 1.99, I think. Um, the adiabatic index? Two. Two. Sorry. Yeah, it, it, uh, we use an adiabatic index of two and and, and, uh, and a polytropic constant of um, I think a hundred. And if you do that, then you end up with a with a star which has one point four solar masses as a as a radius of eleven kilometers. Mm -hmm. Something that looks reasonable. So let me show now what happens if you change the mass. Okay, so we still have a cold equation set, but now we change the mass. It's ten percent difference in the mass. The spiral is pretty much similar. So you have that they merge. And if you remember in the previous movie at this stage you already had produced a black hole. Here you don't. You rather produce a bar-shaped object. It's not exactly a bar, but it's, it's interior is a bar shaped. And this object now it's trying to get rid of all the angular momentum in excess it has. And as it's doing this, it's losing angular momentum, so it's becoming more and more compact. And then at one point you'll be at the threshold for the collapse of black hole and produces a black hole and again a torus. So if you if you want to compare next to each other the high mass and the low mass, here's what happens. Again, you see that <coughs> you produce you have a merger, then you have a series of oscillations. This is the bar which is um, you know going uh, expanding and contracting, and that's why you have this modulation. But you also have this secular increase. That's because the bar is losing angular momentum, so it's becoming more and more compact, spinning faster, becoming more compact, spinning faster, and, and so on. Up until the, the density control is about a factor two, at that point you hit the threshold to instability and collapse for black hole. So, this is telling you what happens if you change mass for the same equation of state. The waveforms will be very different, okay? so this is high mass and low mass. And if you've been looking at waveforms in the case of binary black holes, you will see that the richness here is it's huge. Okay? In, ca in case binary black holes, we do all look like this, essentially. You never see anything like this. Um, let me now consider the other possibility in which I can change the other degree of freedom. Let me add a high mass, but a hot equation of state. If you remember, in, in the previous case, in the cold one, I immediately produced a black hole. Um, what you have in this case is rather different. The spiral is pretty much the same. The trajectory is almost the same. But again, here you don't produce immediately a black hole. You still have something that looks like a bar in the very interior of the, of, of, of the HMNS. And then again, you produce a, a black hole in the torus. And if you look at the torus, the torus is much more expanding. That's because uh, you have a lot of temperature energy here, uh, internal energy, and therefore the pressure support is very high. If you look at the waveforms, that's the way they look like. And, and, and um, again, if you learn to, to, to uh, interpret this, you'll see that there is a, a ring down, as we, we already know that, but then there is a series of, of uh, peaks, and these are as the bar contracts and expands, and as it does this, the amplitude increases and the frequency as well increases. Now, if you, if you follow me, you can ask yourself, well, what if I have a hot equation of state and a low mass? Remember, in the case of cold equation of state, I would have a longer time. What happens now? Well, this is what happens. Nothing happens. Um, you produce an object which is stable over the time scale that, that we have simulated here. So, you, I won't show you the movie, but essentially you would have a bar which is there and is oscillating and, and, and emitting gravitational waves. If you look at the <coughs> density contrast, this is what you see, uh, and you see that in a linear scale, you can see that the, actually de the density is actually growing. Okay? So that's exactly what you expect. The bar is some consistently losing angular momentum, it's becoming more and more compact. It just takes a much longer time to become compact. So, as I said, when you reach a contrast factor of order two, which is somewhere in the next room, you would, you would expect it to produce a black hole. Um, and that's actually what we've done. Um, this collapse is of 110 milliseconds. We have enough computer time to burn to do this calculation. But you can see a bar sending at 100 milliseconds. 
So what, what is the mass of your black holes? Um, so it's essentially the total mass okay. minus a few percent, okay. because that's the amount of mass which is in the torus. <clears throat> if you have a very stiff equation of state mm -hmm. and very low mass neutron stars, one could imagine, at least in principle, actually having a stable that's right. you can. Uh, merger. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Um, so, um, so uh, no, because, well, I mean, so there is no, I mean, I'm not preventing it, okay? So the, the reason why I, I don't produce it is because initial, initial data doesn't, doesn't allow it. I, if I look at the J over M squared of the system, it's larger than one. But yet I produce a black hole, which is a perfectly regular curved black hole. So the system knows not to produce a, a, a naked singularity. It moves the younger momentum uh, so that it doesn't go into the black hole. So <clears throat> this gives you an idea about how the equation of state uh, will leave an imprint on the, on the waveform. We don't see them yet, but you can imagine that uh, one day, uh, hopefully soon, when we will see these waveforms, by, by knowing what is the waveform, we can we can trace back and find out what is the actual equation of state that produced that signal. Um, and uh, this is why I believe that the gravitational waves would be... Um, so that you can think that the, bl the, the blue and the red are here the extremes, two extreme cases. It's a very cold equation of state, essentially, you know, whatever heat is produced is immediately liberated. This is another extreme, this is um, very efficient production of, of energy. And you can think that reality maybe is in between. And, and you can think that, that waveforms will really work as a Rosetta stone to decipher the neutron star in theory. Is the difference so great among realistic equations to say? Um, that is a question I cannot answer because I haven't, <coughs> I haven't run this simulation. But, um, so, let, let, but I, I, I can tell you what I, uh, what I know. What I know is that if we look at the spiral, so just when they are far apart, uh, then it's maybe the difference will not be very large. Um, on the other hand, when I look at the post-merger, so when I look at the, t at the time when um, thermal effects may play an important role and neutrino emissivity might play an important role, then I expect a large difference between among different equations of state. Um, Mind you also that we don't have many equations of state with, which are good to describe the post-merger. So we don't have many equations of state that are, can be really used in a temperature range that goes to 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 12 Kelvin. We have Latimer's West we have Shen et al. equation of state, and that's basically it. All the other, APR and, 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 and whatever, they, they, they're, not, they're not good for, for, the, for after the merger. And is there a danger that neutrino signal will reduce gravitational signal? Neutrino signal? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, so neutrino signal will take place um, when you produce this hypermassive neutron star, you have an object which is very dense and very hot, 10 to 12 Kelvin. Then you ask yourself, I can produce neutrinos. How long will it take for them to leave the system? Um, and then, you know, depending on whether you're using direct Urca or modified Urca, yeah. you, you find that the time scale can be a second, one second, or up to one year. So if it is one year, it won't make any difference, okay? Neutrinos will just go into the black hole. If it is one second, and, you know, given that some of these guys last long enough, maybe neutrinos will leak and we take away some of the energy. Uh, uh, at these high temperatures, mm -hmm. um, essentially, direct drift is always allowed. Yeah, but... Um, um, so it's really just a question of the density in the accretion disk? Yeah, I, it, 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 it... Yeah, so the neutrino is called the scale. It's well, actually the initial, that's what I'm saying. So the first 100, these are 100 milliseconds. Yeah. 100 milliseconds, I think there's no significant neutrino leakage. So they've got to be trapped. It depends on temperature. Yeah, it depends on temperature. It's not a trivial. It's a cool region where you get the gravitational waves. 
Yeah, yeah. it's not coming from much leakage. So the other two regions, yes, but in a very deep core. So you think gravitation waves come from, you focus on the high density region. And there I think there's less leakage. But, but in my lab, yeah, just I'm not saying that. Sure that they are well, very high density regions because, well, they will be well, more or less. Dima, but, but okay, okay, okay. Yeah. to answer your question, okay, so let's just have a number, okay? No, no, <laughs> no, no but let that. so when you, when you go from here to 100 milliseconds, the hypermass neutron star has lost about a couple of percent of its mass in gravitational waves. Um, let's say that neutrinos leak after 100 milliseconds, at that point you will have lost, say, a few per thousand of, of, of the mass. So, yes, it will, it will deplete some of the energy reservoir, but it's not going to be relevant because its gravitational waves will be emitted um, for a much longer time. Um, when you look at this in terms of spectra, this is what you, the kind of spectra you, you get and you have to, to um, then interpret. Again, this is a high mass, blue and red are hot and cold, this is low mass. Things. So when you talk about high mass and low mass, we've got to keep in mind that this is how close the mass is to the maximum mass. Right? An object yeah. that we call a high mass star is something that's close to the maximum mass allowed. No, it's, it's just my convention. High mass is 1.6 in this context. <laughs> <laughs> Low mass is 1.4. Okay. Yeah, but and 2 is, is the maximum mass for this equation. <laughs> so you're still, you still... Know. But if this number is far away from the maximum mass, mm -hmm. these things should look more or less similar. Because, you know, the instability is... You know, why is a small... What am I comparing this to? Uh, to, to I mean, the, the, the fair comparison is between the two, okay? Um, I mean, if, the, if the maximum mass was 10, yes. why, I, you know, then these two would be very similar, and why would there be, why do you expect No, but the maximum mass here is 2, okay? Right. So, 1.4 and 1.6 is about 10% difference, with respect, uh, when, when you normalize to the maximum okay. mass. And so, a 10% difference, at the, at the given equation of state, can lead you to this difference in the behavior. Um, so this is uh, probably units, um, but <laughs> 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 uh, so so if you want to um, okay so so the, if you want any instrument sensitivity curve here, you, you have to imagine that the, the, the instrument would, would just do something like this. Uh, at the arbitrary distance. Well, at the right distance. Things at scale. Distance for each one. Okay. <laughs> So, <laughs> this is a signal that you get, this is in spiral, okay, this, this DK um, is in spiral. Um, this um, forest of peaks uh, that you see here, this is the bar as it is evolving and it's spinning up. So, it, it is um, spanning the higher and higher frequencies. And, um, and then at the end you have this big hump, this is when the, the, the collapse of black hole takes place. Okay, so these are the typical features that you expect to produce in, in this kind of process. You have the spiral, you have the hypermass neutron star emission, and then you have the black hole formation, which is you know, a very strong signal. Now, what is unfortunate you can't see because of, of, of the scale is that if I, if I want to, to put what is um, the sensitivity of any instrument, you would see that essentially it's something like this. So all of this interest in physics, you know, really where equations of state play an important role is, is not detectable by present detectors which have a sweet spot of about 100 hertz, 200 hertz and they really go steeply up about 1 kilohertz so all of this is interesting physics but not for the present detectors the resonant detectors uh, are spot on well the resonant detectors are at the right but you know they are essentially delta dirac in this, in this spectrum so uh, yes <laughs> but I, in fact, you know, third generation detectors want to, 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 to open up this window here at high frequency. Uh, sure. So, uh, for a given equation of state, how precisely do you compute the waveforms? That's a, a, a good question, and uh, I'll, I'll try to, 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 to come back to it later on if you wish. Um, I will just say for the time being that there are parts which I can calculate very precisely 
and other parts which I can calcu can't calculate very precisely. This is one of the things which I don't know how to do well yet. Okay. Um, so, given that I just said that you know detectors can't really see this, um, one can think, well, is this just a waste of time? So, or can we make robust determination of the equation state from the gravitational waves? This is some some work which is in, in yes. yes. What is the what is the contribution due to the closed normal modes? I mean, the power spectrum. In in, in the in the quasi normal modes of the black hole. Yeah, the very last part of the thing. Ah, uh, yeah. Is it it's, to high frequencies or? Is yes, it? of course, it's a high frequency. I mean, it is. So okay. some, something. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think the the the, the exact quasi normal frequency is at seven kilohertz. Yeah, because it's a very low mass black hole. So yeah. 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 It's, it's um, so okay, what can we do? Well, so uh, I've been. When I, I got so frustrated by the fact that detectors can't see all, all the interesting part, I, 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 I've been thinking about whether anything is possible in this case. And so this is really more an idea than anything uh, concrete. Now, this is the amplitude, okay? So just, this is the envelope of the, of the, of the oscillating signal that you will see. And, and you can see that there are two interesting peaks. This is the merger, and this is the collapse, okay? So this is the polytropic high mass. Then I, I look at another polytropic low mass, and it's something like that. You know, there was this, this oscillation, but you still see one peak and the other peak. So there are certainly two peaks here, and, um, and, and so you can define this as a delay time. So this is a time between when the, the system merges and when the system collapses. If I have an ideal fluidic high mass, I also have this delay. If I have a low mass, I have another delay, it starts here. And, as I said, 100 milliseconds later will collapse. So there are these peculiar points. Even if I can't, even if I can't see in the spectrum the relevant frequencies, I can still measure these because this would be signal that I can actually see because I will have a, a, an increase in, in, in my in my in my signal. And and, and so the chances that it is detected are much higher. Um, so. I calculate this tau del, and I, of course, you know, if, in practice, tau del would be a function of the mass, of the equation of state, of the angular momentum that I have uh, at the ISCO when I produce a black hole, at the rate of differential rotation of the magnetic field, radiation transport, neutrino, you name it. Um, but then you, you ask yourself, well, can I simplify all of this and, and have something which is simpler? Um, can I just assume that it's a function of the mass and of the equation of state? Then you plot tau del as a function of mass. But before you show the data, you ask yourself, what do I expect? Well, I expect if I have very high masses, tau del will be infinitesimal. Okay? If you have too much mass, no matter what, what equation of state, it will immediately produce a black hole. So you would expect that the high masses, all the curves will converge here. And then you expect that as the mass decreases, the, time, the delay time also increases. Then you actually plot the data, and this is what you uh, obtain. And okay, this is three points, and three points are not enough to say that you have a straight line, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you're optimistic, you can say, well, maybe there is a simple equation. Maybe if I just look at its delay time, how long the, the hypermassive neutron star stands up, <coughs> maybe I can, I can tell something about equation of state. And you can imagine these are for the two equations I'll try. You can imagine that in this diagram, as you include more equations of state, they will all have a point here and they will have just different rates. Now, what do you do with this? You will know what is the mass because you've seen it during the spiral. The spiral allows you to measure the mass. Then you have measured the delay time. And, and, and of course, you will have the chance of intersecting one of these curves. Um, Sorry, this depends on the total mass. Total masses. Uh, how about does it depend on the ratio of the masses? Um, that's a good point. Um, it, in the case of, of unequal masses, <coughs> the, 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 the larger the difference in the mass, the smaller the, um, the, the delay time. So if you have, I will show later on, if you have that the masses are the same, the system can stand longer in equilibrium. If on the other hand the, the masses are different, one of the two stars will be disrupted, and the other will very rapidly produce a black hole. Mm -hmm. okay? Because we'll not have gained all the angular momentum that you gain through the merger. 
So it's basically measuring how close one of the stars is to the maximum mass. Yeah. And that's why it you know, has a simple dependence. Um, now, how do you do this problem in practice? I mean, you would need to, to have lots of curves here, one for each equation of state. And um, this is way too complicated to, to do, not to, to, to mention it. Um, it would require too much time. So here is where there's a problem where you can use numerics and perturbative schemes uh, <coughs> to, to do the job. So what you want is you assume that once you call, you assume that you produce a star, <coughs> and the star is nothing else but an axial symmetric star plus a bar mode perturbation, nine equal two perturbation, which is losing angular momentum and energy. And then you track down <coughs> in a sequence of equilibria, there where you end up from a stable equilibrium to an unstable one. And you calculate how long does it take for this to happen. So essentially, you start from initial state, which has a certain mass, variable mass, equation of state, angular momentum, differential rotation, circulation. Circulation is important because I need to constrain the initial state in some way. And I know this is a constant, okay? So, during my evolution, I can consider the variable mass, the equation of state, and the circulation to be constant, while allowing for changes in the gravitational mass, in the angular momentum, and differential rotation. And I go along this change up until I end up with something which is unstable. Um, if this is not very clear, let me show you this time. Okay, this might be easier to interpret. Mm -hmm. So this is a standard rho, central, <coughs> versus mass, rotational mass, and it is degree differential rotation. But I mean, just ignore this dimension. <coughs> so you have all of these curves, okay, and you know that roughly the, t the, the, the top, the maximum of this curve represents the dynamical instability limit. Um, and as you have higher and higher uh, omegas, <coughs> you will have that, that these curves will have larger and larger um, branches, larger and larger masses. Okay, then you start with, with a given model and you, you go along in this space of, of equilibria. So I have filled this space of equilibria. I know all the solutions in this space. And I just move from one to the next one by conserving barrier mass and circulation. <coughs> and of course, equation of state. And then I, I keep going down up until I, I hit this surface, which is a critical surface. And when I hit this surface, I know I will have to produce a black hole. I calculate how long it takes for me to go through this. Um, okay, this is what I just said. I calculate how long it takes to do this, and then I put it, this number onto, onto a curve. And this is what I get. So this is the, the, the toy model, um, and this is the, uh, the actual variable data. So you, there is a little bit of tuning which is required here because I need to, to, to prescribe how much angular momentum I'm, being, I'm losing. So how big is, uh, is the deformation of the bar? But you see that once you tune that, you have a very good uh, fix to the actual numerical data. So this is just a, a proof of principle. It can be done. And now we're trying to do this sort of realistic equation of state. OK. <coughs> now let's switch gear and, and, and let's go to unequal mass binary. So let's see what happens in this case. <coughs> um, so we've done a, a number of models, seven. And, and these are the models um, in this, so in this um, the convention, the first number is the total mass, 3.4 solar masses, and the other number, 0 0.7, is the mass ratio. So mass of the small one over the mass of the big one. We try to cover recently the space of parameters. Um, so there is a lot of things I can say, but let, let, me, let me rather show a movie so that might help. So this is the mass is 3.7, mass ratio 0.94. So this is very similar, okay? And here I'm, sh I'm cutting up the, the, uh, the, the top of, of the star so you can see better the interior. You see that one is accreting on the other, clearly that the less mass is accreting on the other. And, and this is what you produce. Again, a black hole, but now you have a torus which is much, much larger than, than in the past. Um, if you want to, these are the things to remember. The tori are generically more massive, they are more extended, and they are tend to a quasi-caplarial configuration. 
Um, if you look at the waveform, these are the waveforms. <coughs> so they are pretty boring. Um, and then, and then you don't see anything. This is why I was mentioning that as you uh, have <coughs> deviations away from equal masses, the, 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 the collapse of the black hole is very rapid. And also, if you see here, it's very hard to to get a quasi-normal mode ringing. And the reason for this is simple: you have produced a torus which is much larger, and and this chokes the ringing of the black hole. There is a large accretion onto the black hole, and the black hole can't freely ring down. But you will get it eventually when the torus is swallowed by the black hole, right? Well, I mean, it's too late. You, you know, you, you 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 will have the exponential out of a very small signal. <laughs> okay. um, right. Um, so th this is another funny diagram, <coughs> which allows you to appreciate the differences. This is an equal mass. And so here I'm, I'm plotting the space-time diagram of the rest mass density along one direction, say the x. And 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 so this is what you see, <coughs> and you you interpret this by saying that. You have this torus which is expanding, so it's moving towards larger x, and then contracting, move, moving towards the black hole. The black hole is over here, and every time it does this, it has a periodic accretion. And it is in contrast what happens if you have unequal masses. Okay? You have these huge spiral waves which are shot at large distances. Most of this is, is, well, all of this is really bound, but it still goes a long way away. And then you have a continuous accretion all the way. Um, so here I don't have, we don't have many different here. No, when you get, you get a burst of accretion and nothing else, you should get X-ray emission, right, for a short. You mean in this case? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So here you are. I put it, I put so you want spread. an X-ray source that's not been seen before? Yeah, maybe. Um, I mean, this is a Some frequency of. Uh, uh, that's probably few. still very opaque. <laughs> Yeah. It's, it's non negligible density of material surrounding this object. Do you think it was self obscure? Um, I mean, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. It, it's very hot and very dense. Um, you, have, you have increased. You see that the density increases and then increases. So. How much mass is in the. Can you, can you wait a second? I'll give you the number exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, so. What I want to show next is, is instead the angular momentum. So this is a specific angular momentum. So in Newtonian gravity, this is omega r squared. Okay? And you see that there is a, this is the equal mass and this is the unequal mass. If you look at the, at the color coding, that you have dark green, uh, light green, and, and the other way around here, shell tells you that the two tori have very different structure and distribution of angular momentum. Um, so here is the masses, uh, Chuck. So these are um, the, different, um, the different models. And this is the mass of the torus in solar masses. And this can, can give you, you know, if you compare to the solar, to the equal mass, which gives you maybe a few percent, this can give you a whole lot more. I mean, 0.1 of solar masses. And um, mm -hmm. you can derive a simple expression. I mean, you can guess what should be the dependence and then obtain this scaling of the mass of the torus. So you get a big torus if Q is a, as small as possible. And of course, if the difference between the masses is, is, is um, also high. So M max is the maximum mass that you can produce a binary in this system. So I have two, two binaries, both of which, the two stars in the binary, both of which are near the maximum mass. No, I said. Oh, because you write away. Can I ask a yeah. question? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. At this point. Yeah. If it is the case to get the gamma ray burst, you need the massive this, the massive yes. torus. And it is the case that uh, a massive, or the massive torus quenches the gravitational wave, mm -hmm. then does not point to it would be very hard to have a constant yes. gamma ray burst in the gravitational wave. Yeah. So we've just killed one of the LIGO groups. <laughs> no, but okay, it's, um, it, that would kill you the part of the signal which is related to the black hole formation, okay? Which is a very important contribution. A lot of energy goes there, but you know, it, 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 you would still be able to see the inspiring. 
Oh, the English Bible, yes, but the, I thought you were quenching the uh, sort of hypermassive style part as well. Yeah. Probably. Yeah, no, yeah that, that because that is very rapid. And so you certainly would have a smaller uh, mm -hmm. energy going on. What is the frequency range that the black hole formation uh, with? I mean, you said that two bursts, one is the inspire, and, yes. and then black hole formation is the other. Yes. I mentioned that it's a different thickness. Yes, sorry. Um, let me bring it up again. So it's easier. So this is in spiral. Okay, um, and there's a maximum here, which is about I don't know, 700 or so hertz. Um, then you have the upper massive neutron star. Let's let's have a look at this. You know, the the, the hot equation of surface is more realistic. The bar is it's oscillating at a, at a few kilohertz. And then I haven't shown it, but you have the black hole, which really is produced at 10, at seven kilohertz in these So black hole formation is currently there is no currently designed detector which will see the second. Yeah, so it's only the first bit. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, all of this, you, you have to imagine that it's a matter of, of, of distance, right? So this is your sensitivity curve. You take, it, you, you take the, the pessimistic view that your source is, is at, at, at a large distance, it, you know, really at the edge of the volume you can observe. And then you would see something that, that goes like that. Um, and you have this, this frequency, and then you have the black hole formation, OK? But that's if, because you put your, 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 <coughs> your source far away. You put your source know, in the galaxy, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> 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 you see everything. Okay? So then your, your statement that there is no detector design, it, it, it's, you know, statistically, it's true. But you know, it doesn't mean that LIGO can't see it. So seriously speaking, if you had this in the galaxy, would LIGO see yeah, 70 yeah, so. hertz? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> so this is 100 megaparsecs, okay, so um, we're talking about 10 to the uh, 2, 6, um, and then 18, so this is 10 to 26 centimeters, and the galaxy is what, 100 kiloparsec, uh, so it's a factor 3, um, you would have a factor 3 in amplitude. Um, yeah, so I think yeah, you can, you can, you, uh, maybe, maybe not, but <laughs> I don't know, I would need to, 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 maybe not exactly at the edge of the galaxy, <laughs> close to the solar system. <laughs> 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 but we wouldn't survive, <laughs> so the detector would see it, but we would all be there. <laughs> okay, but then coming back to Nils' question, because it's still a you're predicting, uh, I mean, that calculation that you did about the two, Delay, time delay between the two peaks. So basically, you wouldn't see it in gravitational waves with carbon design detectors, but you could still try to look uh, uh, for time delay between gravitational wave bursts that you see with LIGO and electromagnetic uh, bursts that you see from accretion of the black hole. For instance, yeah. So that but my, my yeah. You, you, what, you, what you would see is, you know, you would see essentially. Um, is this peak which, that, that, that you would see, and then the first peak, which is essentially the break from the inspire, which is this peak. So it's these peaks here that you have to concentrate. And because these are fairly larger than any other signal, any other part of the signal, I hope that you can see them because they come up you know, as observable. But even if you don't see the first peak, you can still predict its location from the inspire or from what you see. You do well, see no, you don't, you don't really, well. The first uh, peak is just the base score, right? Huh? The first peak is the ISCO. Well, the, the, the effective ISCO, we don't know yeah. what is the ISCO, right? So yeah, but you can compute from post on Yeah, but it's a, okay, it's, 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 a, it's, it's, it's a very rough estimate. Yeah, it's going to be better with time, though. Maybe we'll look at a few years away. So, uh, in principle, you can, see, you can see this also, or infer this also from other considerations. You see it in SPAL, and you know when you would expect the first peak, the and then one. maybe if there is an electromagnetic. Signature, you get the second. Yeah. And you will be for a galactic event. You'll you'll have a neutrino detection. Then you will have if you then you'll have a, an independent measure of when the black hole formed because the neutrino signal would drop pretty dramatically. Once I mean, if happens. it happens in the galaxy, I don't think we will have problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm saying even if you don't see the second peak because you know you. You're, yeah. <laughs> 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 Unnoticed binary neutron 
star pair at the edge of the solar system. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Just behind the moon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're more force stupid. Yeah. So, um, I, I'm afraid I have to go and, and on. So now let's, let's, but I'm, I'm almost at, at one hour, so but I, I will ask the chairman if I can have, you know, for a few more minutes. Remember, the next talk by the previous is next morning. morning. The next talk is at 10 tomorrow morning, so there's plenty of time. Okay, but I don't want to, to so if people are getting tired. So let me talk about what happens if you have magnetic fields, because this is also an interesting um, variant in the picture. <coughs> So, we all know that neutron stars have large magnetic fields, and you know, it's natural to ask what is the role play with these magnetic fields. So, first question can we detect magnetic fields during the inspiring? Uh, can we detect them after the, the, the merger? What is the influence these magnetic fields have on the dynamics of the torus around the black hole? So, these are easy questions to formulate, these are very tough to answer. Uh, what we're doing is uh, we're going into ideal MHD, so we use a simpler version of MHD with infinite conductivities, but as I've shown you before, given that the time scales are, are, are very short, is a very good approximation. How do you put in a magnetic field? Well, you, add, you, you take your stress energy tensor, you add uh, the contribution from them, and you solve Maxwell's equation. In practice, if you want to put in <coughs> a poloidal magnetic field, you introduce a, a, a toroidal vector potential, of this type, <coughs> so this is really a, a, an analog prescription, and you can see that uh, this is done so that the magnetic field is all confined inside the star. So the magnetic fields are initially contained inside the star. There is no magnetospheric effect. This is just because magnetospheres are a headache, and we prefer not to to have that headache. This is really the standard prescription. So we have considered eight binaries, <coughs> low and high, and four different magnetic. Fields. 10 to the 12, 14, 17. Now, why is it that we're using 10 to the 17? I'm not claiming that two neutron stars with 10 to the 17 are realistic. I'm just trying to push the limit. Okay? Actually, there are reasons to believe that when two neutron stars emerge, they will have rather moderate magnetic field. And just to remind you, 10 to the 18 is when you have a strong enough magnetic field to break them apart. <coughs> so. This is what you, what you obtain when you do the simulations. And these are two, the same mass with two magnetic fields. This is a low mass and this is a high mass. Um, you can see that <coughs> there is a difference, both in the inspiral, they start on top of each other, but then they depart. And then, of course, also in the post-merger phase. Um, and you see that the red here produces a black hole. You, you learn how to recognize the quasi normal mode, while the black <coughs> doesn't. Do we understand this? So it's, it's easy to understand. <coughs> the black is always delayed with respect to the red. Don't forget, it's a very large magnetic field. So the stars have a very large magnetic tension which keeps them together. They are less tidally deformed, and so they can get closer to each other. The extreme case in this case, in this sense, is two black holes. The black holes can get as close as possible because they have any, they have very little tidal deformability, and that is why here the merger happens later. See, the black is always the merger always happens happen, happens later. And the evolution of the magnetic field. Do you follow the evolution? Sure, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll show you. So if, it, if it is initially turned to the 17, then it will be parallel. Of course, it? yes. And this is why this guy, the black one, stands up. The, the red produces a black hole, but the black one has produced so much magnetic field, there's a large magnetic pressure support, and so can stand against gravity for a longer time. Of course, also this guy will eventually collapse. And these are aligned magnetic fields. These are aligned magnetic fields. <coughs> Okay, um, so with the line, what, I mean, what is the aligned with the orbital angular momentum. So, you know, it's, it's two stars like that. Symmetry. You know, this is uh, this is L, and you have poloidal magnetic field like this. It stays like this all the time, so much no. or then just no, 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 no. This is just initial data. Then, of course, 
you know, you would have inner motions which start deforming the, the magnetic field. Then you follow the magnetic field in 3D. Then you follow the magnetic field in 3D. All of know, this is all in the You know, it's a fully 3D okay. general relativistic energy. So let, let's, let me try to answer the, the, the question. Uh, remember, the first question was, how can I, can I detect the magnetic field during the experiment? So that amounts to calculating how close the red and, and, and the black curve are before the merger. Okay. But there, are, <coughs> there are ways to do this mathematically. Essentially, you calculate the inner product between two waveforms. <coughs> you, you, the, you, you, you weigh this against a certain detector sensitivity, so you take a certain waveform for a magnetic field one and then two, you take the color product, you divide everything by the sensitivity of a given detector, and then you calculate the overlap, which is essentially this color product um, this number equal to one means that the two are indistinguishable. This number very large, very different from one means they are distinguishable. <laughs> um, so this is the result. This is high mass and low mass. Um, so this is the larger magnetic field, and you can see essentially that you really need to go to super extreme strong magnetic field in order to see a difference. So you really have to go to ten to the for a high mass, you have to go to 10 to the 15 or so gauss to see a difference. Now, all of this is dependent on which detector I'm talking about. Take your favorite one. This is LIGO, Virgo. Their intrinsic capability is 995, so it's somewhere below here. That means they can't tell them apart. Not even if they have 10 to the 12 gauss. Does this assume that you know the, the waveform without the magnetic field? Sure. So this is. Yeah. Uh, a scalar product between um, B, so it's HB0, HB. Okay, so I'm, I'm comparing the no magnetic field with magnetic field. But to know the no magnetic field waveform to this accuracy um, sounds I remarkable. No, I think, I think it's more a statement saying if you use a no magnetic field as a template, yeah. then when are you going to use it? So I'm assuming that HB0 is exact. So are you going to detect? Okay. The magnetic field signal with a non-magnetic antenna. That's really mm -hmm. um, So, at these resolutions, this is the, the overlap for B less than 10 to 17. Because the match is even higher for lower masses, the influence of magnetic field on its part is unlikely to be detected. You really have to have very sensitive detectors or very large magnetic fields. And astrophysicists would say you can forget having two Magnetars inspiring uh, amazing. But if, but in the case there will be a polarizal component of the magnetic field, perhaps the situation will be different, no? What do you mean? A large polarizal component. Toroidal. Oh, toroidal. Yes. I'm sorry, yeah. So, um, uh, there will be, well, there could be some, well. I, I don't know, I mean, uh, this, this, here I'm concentrating. Here I'm concentrating just on this part of this of, of the inspire. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm cutting all the waveforms here before the merge. If you, if you assume uh, 10 to uh, eight, uh, 18, the uh, component it will have effect. <laughs> so, so Dima, concentrate on, on, on what happens before the the, the merger, okay? Mm -hmm. And okay. You, you may think that different poloidal, different magnetic field configuration will change this slightly. But again, you really have to go to very large magnetic fields. So I don't think that magnetic field orientation or magnetic field topology will really change this. What happens afterwards, that will be much more sensitive, in my view, to what is the topology of the magnetic field. Because if you have a, a purely poloidal one, and I'll show you in a second, then you will produce toroidal. If you start with just toroidal, you can't produce toroidal. So, okay. um, but it's necessary to have the field combined in the start. I mean, you expect to have uh, more effect if you were to allow them to interact you know, through the magnetospheres. Yeah, so if you, if you work this out <coughs> in post Newtonian um, approximation, you see that. Also in that case, you would expect a change in the number of cycles due to magnetospheric interactions to be large, just for very large magnetic fields. 
So the bottom line is that I don't think that would really make change the situation. Um, so as, as Dima was pointing out, <coughs> there is something interesting here going on. The two stars, as you've seen, don't merge head on. They come close to each other and they rub against each other. You produce a shear interface, the velocity allowed is continuous. <coughs> This leads to a Kelvin almost instability and a possible turbulent motion. So you have, and this, you know, instability, the way it affects magnetic field growth is very important. Um, so here is a funny movie. Um, you have to imagine that you have two eyes, that the right eye is just looking at density, and the left eye is just looking at, at vorticity. I am actually multiplying the vorticity by rho so that I, I just concentrate on the interior of the star. <coughs> <laughs> so you see the vorticity is very small at the beginning, but then as they merge and they rub against each other, the, the vorticity becomes very large in this shear layer. Okay? Now, what, what do you do with this? Um, you have, let's have a look at what happens in that movie. Now, we are in a co-moving frame, quote unquote, because you know, everything is differential already. But say I am in a, in a frame where the velocity here is uh, at the center is zero. And you see these nice little vortices which are produced. So this is turbulent. And you have vortices which are steering the, the, the stellar material. <coughs> because you start from this configuration, if you have turbulent motion in the xy plane, you will produce toroidal magnetic field. Now this is just the same picture in, uh, as a scale. <coughs> so can you can you produce magnetic field? Yes, you can. <coughs> so <coughs> this is the magnetic field evolution. B is the total, T is the toroidal, P is the poloidal. You see that I start essentially with, with machine precision toroidal. And then at the merger I have this exponential growth here of the of the toroidal magnetic field. The, the exponential <coughs> growth stops at this stage when you essentially reach a equipartition. Um, so this is the first evidence in full GR that a magnetic field can be increased exponentially. This is really the important word, exponentially, by the, 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 this instability. Price and Rosberg had already, tried, had already shown this in Newtonian physics, but they were using um, completely different other dynamics, and, and their result was, was not, in my view, very convincing. They were getting very different features with very different resolutions. Um, okay, here is another movie, and uh, now I'm showing you essentially what, 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 uh, what happens when you have a magnetic field. But it is a bit more complicated movie because I want to show at the same time density and magnetic field. So again, I'll have the trick of, of, of the surface. On the right, I will show magnetic field amplitude. So this is the log of pi di, and this is the density. So it is a high mass in terms of the top, though it's a moderate initial magnetic field. Where is it pointing? Sorry? Where is it pointing? It, um, sorry. Um, the field is like this. Okay. Now, what, uh, this is useful. You can start seeing that you know, um, there, there are large internal motions that are produced in this disturbed um, magnetic field structure. <coughs> then you have an hypermassive neutron star and you produce a black hole. Then you have a lot of action going on in the torus around the black hole. Now I will tilt everything so you will feel sick for a second. <coughs> you can see actually the density distribution and this is the magnetic field. Now, I don't want to suggest anything, but you see there is something coming out of, of, of the plane. This might be a lead jet launching, but um, the point is, the reason why I don't go further is because um, um, my evolution here becomes um, not trustworthy. I have large violations of divergence of V. I know why this is the case, essentially because I'm not doing a good enough job with mesh refinement. And so I have to stop here. But uh, so this is the, the state of the art in, 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 in this business. We see that you know you can produce a very large magnetic field. The torus 
can steer the magnetic field and produce a larger one, and you have a large, very high entropy material, strong magnetic field is easily the, the recipe for, for launching that. Okay, now, just to, 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 to keep faith on my title, uh, I will say what the things that I don't know how to do. Now, <laughs> question mark not to scale, this is a joke that Anna has, has suggested. This is not a question mark. <laughs> this is actually a tidal wave produced when you have a neutron star which is disrupted by a black hole. You don't see the black hole, the black hole is there. But it looks like an interesting <laughs> question mark. So, um, first of all, think, things can go very wrong and you can get very bad answer. So, <clears throat> This is um, essentially the same thing that I've shown you before. Um, the same waveform. The black is 10 to the 7, no, here is the wrong. Um, the red is 10 to the 17, the zero is, um, the black is zero uh, gauss. And um, this is what you do when you have a high order method, okay? So this is a numerical method which tries to, to be as accurate as possible. This is a third order, this is a second order. This is exactly the same initial data. You get completely different answers. You see, the, the, the merger is completely wrong. He, this guy does one orbit and then merges. This guy does uh, two and a half orbits and then merges. And then here you don't see any difference whatsoever between <coughs> magnetized and unmagnetized behavior. And Shapiro had, had used this <coughs> similar second order method and had concluded there is no difference. And this just shows you that you know if you don't do things carefully enough, you might have a completely wrong answer. <coughs> Magnetic field evolution. So, um, as I said, we are very proud that we, we've been able to show that there is exponential um, magnetic field growth. Um, but do we really know how to study this? If you think about it, the study the Kelvin Elmo's instability, the MHD consequences. It's tough enough when you do this in a shearing box simulation. So you, you take a, a very nice box, regular, with boundary conditions that you can specify, and you have two fluids which are just moving across each other at, at, at precise uh, speed. Now think about, and, and they're already it's just a mess, and they have resolutions of 10 centimeters, while our world is of the order of 200 meters. So imagine of, of trying to get this, a clear picture uh, in our conditions is very tough. This is a low resolution run, this is a high resolution, a med resolution run, this is a high resolution run. You see the standard features are always there, so you have turbulence which is being produced. But all of a sudden, the, the game becomes much more complex. We don't know how to solve, how to model turbulence, certainly not in, in these conditions. And this essentially means that we cannot measure accurately what is the magnetic field growth. So, maybe this is irrelevant if you start with a low magnetic field, and the Kelvin Elmholtz doesn't last long enough, okay? As I've shown you, sometimes the black hole is immediately produced, so you don't have a lot of time to, to produce magnetic field. But if there are other times when you have time, <coughs> and so this is, is a reason, it's, it's, it's a serious drawback. <coughs> Post-merger complications. <coughs> Here you have three curves, which um, have been rescaled to be on top of each other. If they are on top of each other, you, 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 are, you are confident they are, you are in a convergent regime. So they are never on top of each other, but they are reasonably on top of each other. But then they, 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 the, the binary merges, <coughs> so this is the Hamiltonian constraint. For those of you who are not familiar, this is a measure of the error. Um, you see that these are not really on top of each other. That's because when they merge, we have a, a degradation of the, of, of the convergence order. We are second order during the expiry because the, the two neutron stars are two nice fluids moving almost, uh, well, essentially without shocking. But then as soon as they shock, your, your convergence order degrades, becomes first order. This is exactly what you expect. I mean, there's nothing new. But it degrades. That means that you, in order to, to get a, an accurate number here, you have to have a much higher resolution. And then when you produce a torus, again, you are second order because, again, the motion is, is regular and, and and not complicated. If you look at the at the kind of evolution, <coughs> this is the kind of evolution that you get. This is a waveform and high resolution and mad resolution. You see they are on top of each other. 
you can show that they actually convergent by looking at the difference between these two guys <coughs> and, and scaling. Again, the fact that they are on top of each other is a proof that it's second order. This, we are the only group that, that it dares to do these kind of uh, comparisons. Uh, the others don't even try. But there are some nightmares, and this, this addresses uh, Yuri's question. What is it that I know how to... How to <coughs> what can I trust and what I cannot trust? So this is a, the density contrast. You've seen this before. <coughs> Uh, one, then you have a few oscillation, then you produce a black hole. These are low resolution, then you increase the resolution, and you see that the upper mass neutron star lasts a bit longer. Okay. And you have a higher resolution, and you try, oh, well, I mean, we are converging. You know, the difference between the black and the red is much smaller than the difference between the, the red and the blue. That's what you would expect. The arrow becomes smaller and smaller. And then someone has a bad idea to try an even higher resolution, and this is what you get. <laughs> <laughs> so that means that we don't know what we're doing here. We don't. We, we can't. We're not yet in a convergent regime. We can't tell really accurately how long the upper mass neutron star lasts at these masses. Um, so these are the type of resolutions. I mean, these are really high resolutions. If you look at the waveforms, this is the kind of waveforms that you obtain, okay? And you can see, and now there's a zoom in, the in spiral is essentially on top of each other. So, I have no problem in, in, in doing the in spiral. The in spiral is robust. It's the post-merger which is less robust. Now, this is not a rule. If I have high masses, I don't have any problem. Essentially because I immediately produce a black hole. And I've shown you that I have second order convergence. If I have low masses, then I still, you know, I'm far away from the black hole threshold and I see again convergence. So the problem is really for those masses which are close to the threshold to instability and, um, and are therefore more delicate to treat. So the conclusion you can draw. So, first of all, let me say that no one has reported something like this, although when we, we have asked them to check, they, they seem to have found the same problem. So, I'm pretty sure this is true. So, conclusion one is, the, inter the dynamics for intermediate masses require a resolution higher than the normal, and we, you know, the, the, the green one is just on the verge of convergence. If, if I tried another one, another resolution, I would be on top of the, of the green one. That's conclusion A. Conclusion B is, we don't really understand the nonlinear dynamics of self-gravitating system near the threshold to black hole formation. And I have a number of arguments why it is, I believe we don't understand this. We, we, we are starting to see critical behavior in these situations. Or we're seeing nonlinear stabilization of, of, this is of linearly unstable modes. Okay, this is something that actually Nils has also worked on. So, if you do a, non, a, a linear analysis, you would expect a certain star to become unstable. But if you subject, if you, if you put this star into non-linear oscillations, you see that the very same model we should collapse a black hole actually stands up against the color. But clearly this is, um, in my view, this, this high resolution of microphysics will not solve this problem. We really have to go back to the blackboard and try to understand what does non-linear GR, or self-gravitating system, want to do in these cases. <coughs> okay. Um, future developments. Uh, I think uh, I'll, I'll be go very quickly on this. Already using the official record. So we want to do resistive MHD. This is um, this could be interesting because you have a lot of plasma, and ideal MHD is good as long as you have low temperature and, 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 and high density. Okay. Sigma is, is a steep function of rho and t. But when you produce this torus, you have high temperature. Uh, sorry, I said sigma is a, is a function of, uh, is high for low temperatures and high density. When you produce a torus, you have exactly the opposite. You have high temperature and low densities. So sigma might go to not a very large number, and you might have resistive effect. So we, we've been doing some, some tests in 2D. This is a rather complex problem because resistive MHD 
changes completely the nature of the equation. You have a parabolic path you have to take care of. And there are complex methods to do this, but so that's what, what we want to do. Resist the MHD. Realistic, or if you wish, physically motivated EOS. We have already a number of cold equations of state implemented. And also some hot ones which we are uh, implementing. But, you know, I'm still not convinced that it's a good idea to go in this direction. This goes to the philosophical prelude number two. Um, maybe putting more physics is not really giving you insight if you don't understand the basic physics, like the ones I was mentioning. And then we have polytrops, polytrops, polytrops. <laughs> so, for those of you who don't like this, close your ears. But there is a, there is a group led by, by John Friedman at, in, in Milwaukee who is trying to work out how much you can distinguish uh, equations of state if you parameterize them as piecewise polytropes. So you just write your P as a cold and a thermal one, and the cold one is just a, uh, is just a gluing of different polytropes. And if you choose your Ks and your gammas appropriately, you can essentially span all of the major equations of state by just changing a few parameters. And so the idea is let's, let's <coughs> compute number of different waveforms uh, using you know, resources from different groups who can do similar things and see how much, if you had 20 waveforms, all with different k's and gammas, how much can you tell them apart and once you know how much you can tell them apart then you can know how much you can um, you can learn from looking at the spiral about the equation of state. Radiative transfer, <coughs> as I said um, Depending on temperature density and emission process, modified or direct, the diffusion time scale can be comparable larger than the time necessary to produce a blend. And we want to, to do this now in, in whiskey. Whiskey, by the way, is our code that does this kind of thing. We will use a relativistic leakage scheme, um, which is the simplest. And then we also have to move towards better numerical techniques. <coughs> um, the, the, this convergence order degradation is still there, but if you use these continuous Galerkin methods, which are the, the fanciest thing you can do these days, um, you can improve your resolution in, 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 in the absence of shock. So you might have better resolution for the same computational cost. Okay, so here are my conclusions. If I look for back four or five years, uh, there is just reason to be very proud. There's been a huge progress. And we can now, for the first time, provide inputs to data analysis and gamma reverse physics community. Before, you know, we were just doing toy models. <coughs> if we look at the idealized equation of states, the ones I was presenting, I think we have a complete picture. We know how the spiral emerges and collapse happens, and we can draw this picture with, with and without magnetic field for equal and unequal masses. When it comes down to magnetic fields, they are unlikely to be detected during the spiral but they are important after the merger, especially because they will be amplified by dynamos or instabilities. The spiral is pretty simple and robust, as I've shown. The post-merger is less so. The physics of the merger are extremely complex and delicate. Much remains to be done if you want to do this realistically. And again, it's, you know, this, the, 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 the recurring theme is what is realistic. Um, both from a microphysical point of view, if you want to do more microphysics, and from a macrophysical point of view, we want to understand really what is the role played by instabilities and nonlinear effects. <coughs> so, thank you for your attention. I don't want to keep people from the real whiskey. <laughs> but uh, I want to get back to Chuck's question about uh, light neutron stars, right enough that the merged object still remains a neutron star. Can such simulations be done? And in yeah, some I mean, cases, it's, it's, um, just a wild idea. I mean, you know, if there's a way to exponentially grow the magnetic field, and you make a final object that has large magnetic field, you take canonical atomic neutron stars and you know, you go from mm -hmm. 10 to the 12, 10 to the 15, you know, um, is that a way to make magnetars? Which gives the supernova remnants that we see would not be supernova remnants, they'd be the remains of the torus. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there is, there is no, I mean, if, if I start with a total mass which is less than the maximum mass, I, I, I will still produce a stable object. Uh, I, I, as a matter of fact, 
I can be well above the maximum mass because you know this object has a large pressure support and has a large differential rotation, so you know you can <coughs> afford larger masses. Um, whether or not you can produce very large magnetic field in this uh, manner is in principle possible, but I wouldn't trust my result for the same reason that you know I don't I don't trust my ability to describe turbulence when they merge. Okay. So um, you know if you want a rough estimate then then I can produce such a calculation. If you want a one percent precise answer, I think you would have to No, I mean if you get a rough estimate and you say that you can take a ten to the twelve <laughs> gas field and turn turn it into a ten to the fifteen gas field. Yeah. And somebody else comes and tells me magnetars are very heavy, then there may be something there. Mm -hmm. And why would you why would you think that this is a better way of producing magnetars? What other way is that? That, that is a better way of producing money. Well, I don't know. I mean, the proton neutron star convection and things yeah. like that. Why doesn't that work in all the you know, in a bigger class of neutron stars? Well, no, I mean, because you have to start with something which produces a, a stable object from the merger. If you look at you know the present observed masses, they are you know they are not. You don't see small masses neutron stars, and um, it's not obvious to me that you can you know. And if you look at the binaries, for instance, the binaries all come pretty much close to 1.35. Yeah, right. So the maximum mass has to be something like 2.5. Well, the birth rate of magnetite is slightly higher than the binary merger birth rate. Yeah, so the, 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 ready mechanism, the ready mechanism doesn't work for all. <laughs> <laughs> We have to retain Chris Compton's idea for a few. Right, <laughs> you have two classes of magnetars. <laughs> of course you do. I think having no, no masses for magnetars isn't really helping here. Is my question correct that in your magnetic simulations you have put equal magnetic fields in both? Yes, yes, yes. And haven't you tried some in this? To put some difference between no, I haven't tried, but let me tell you why I think this would be a useful exercise. Um, so let's concentrate on these numbers, okay? <laughs> let's concentrate on these numbers. You have that the difference between a 10 to the well, the zero magnetic field and a 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 12 is one part in 10 to the 4. That is telling you that the role played by a magnetic field during the spiral is extremely small, essentially one part in 10 to the 4. Now, even if I have two different magnetic fields, and I can choose one which is 10 to the 15 and the other one which is smaller, I expect that the difference will be of this order. I don't expect it to be much larger than this. Yes, but but if you have uh, the second field, say, uh, half times 10 to the 17... Uh okay, but then you have to go, you know, I had a real, we had a real problem publishing this paper because, um, because the referee said, this is nonsense, you can't have a neutron star with 10 to 17 gauss. So, since this experience, I'm not going to use 10 to 17 anymore. Uh. <laughs> 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 yeah, but, see, we've been talking nonsense for almost two weeks. <laughs> 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 okay, the, 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 this is a community where we are happy to nonsense. So, yeah, the funny thing is actually yeah. this, 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 this work was motivated by reproducing the results of Shapiro, who was essentially getting one all the time. And he was using 10 to 17. So we have, we have used 10 to 17 just to compare with him. Um. And then you have exponential growth, right? So, <coughs> it's going to be much higher uh, than 10 to the 17 than the Well, not so, so much. I mean, so uh, in principle, you go over this 10 to the 18 limit where you can start getting pair production. So, if you so look at. Right. So, so you say if it gets to 10 to the 18 and then blows yeah. itself apart. So it's going to be pair production and the field's going to I mean, basically radiate away. Right? Yeah. This is what you. you, you, you so, what I don't show you here is it, the, the magnetic field becomes very large, uh, much larger. But that's because the, the star is collapsing, so you just have flux freezing. But this is 10 to the 12. This is 10 to the 12. I, I'm showing this just to show that, you know, here also the instability is operating. And what you do is you, you increase the magnetic field, but not a whole lot. What you increase is the toroidal part. Okay? And then you bring it up to the poloidal part. 
to be comparable. So you end up with a, a net increase of the total magnetic field, which is a factor of a few, just because you had no toroidal when you produce. Doesn't this, does at some point the field limit the sharing? Yes, of course. Okay. And, 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 and you know, this this picture will be different for different initial magnetic fields. It is indeed. During in spiral, and when does the temperature rise? Above say one MeV, when can we forget this bit about all the component superfluids? <laughs> um, so essentially, the answer to this question comes um, comes from looking at this type of. And this type of figures. Okay, so. You see that essentially your the density doesn't change considerably, but after the merger, so superfluid can still be a good approximation. More probably is a good, is a bad approximation during it. I don't think you will have a lot of heating coming from it. When you have these egg-shaped objects, yeah. no, don't forget the eggs is part of my gauge conditions. Okay, yeah, they are. They, 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 I have coordinates which move all over the place in the medical activity. Everything is dependent on gauges. So the, the, the egg shape is amplified by by this. If you look at the real, you know, in co proper coordinates, they are less egg like, uh -huh. like and more like olives. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> uh, olive shape. Um, could it be the case that the the crust rotates but, but the superfluid inside does not? Oh yes. Okay. So, so the moment of inertia of these things is much so this suppressed. Is question, this is a question that we're sort of thinking about and working on, which is to what extent is it possible that the additional degrees of freedom are exciting or so not during the inspiral? So, is it a difference by taking one component setup of a, or a multi component in the tidal, the tidal interaction during the inspiral? That's mm -hmm. a possibility, but yeah. it's not. So, that's, it's got very little to do with heat. I think once you get the shock heating, I think that's game over. And then also the dynamic is so quick. But, but, but the, the shock heating is just like. Yeah, that's right. So the, the, you're thinking about up, up to merge. During this spiral, I think the, the main scope in, in thinking about what, what are the effects of superfluids. But it, it is one. So this is roughly the time scope, this is in milliseconds. <coughs> the, this is really the exponential decay, okay? So <coughs> here you have an exponential because that's, this is the ring down, you know, if you, if you, this is, because it is the square of psi four, um, this is just an exponential in this way. Otherwise you would see the ring down going up and down. And, and so this is an exponential and the time scale where the damping is, you know, of the order of the, the fraction of a millisecond. But the rise time is you know, it's a bit large. So this whole burst of black hole formation comes on the time scale of millisecond. Yes, the, the, the rise time is of order millisecond. The, 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 the decay time is even smaller. So in principle, you could put, uh, I mean, the actual uh, waves uh, come outside of the line of time. But if you consider non linear memory, but that's a DC signal. Uh, uh, it has all frequency components, yeah. including the ones. So the, the characteristic frequency of the memory burst equals to the characteristic duration of this burst emission. So if your burst emission comes over a time scale of several milliseconds, well, there you have uh, a component which is. Uh, yeah, maybe. Um, maybe. I, haven't, I haven't really thought about this, but I don't see why not. I think maybe that's a nice place to break.
um, for everybody, we're going to have a little um, informal you know, discussion out there. There's some um, mind and practice and things for those who are interested. Um, and could those who have said they're coming to dinner later, please stay in the room. And we've got a little bit of information about that, where that's. It could be helpful, say, to know where it is. Okay, so if uh, other people are just going to go out to serve themselves a glass of wine, they'll look. Tell Sanjay where there is. Is that a group of people who are going to leave from here, go there? Yeah, I just have, I just have a little uh, piece of information first. You need to know who to follow, right? Huh? You need to know who to follow. Yeah. At all uh, time. Yeah, follow him. Right. Do you want to have a little slide? A little umbrella. On the way there, follow the drops. So what was the Half past seven, you said. The, the... Um, yeah, okay, so we have to leave here something like that. Um, it's a, okay. So it's an order of message. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we, we've said um, um, half past seven in this place. Because there's uh, a fair few of us, we have decided what you're going to eat. We're going to the place we went the other night, the Glenfiddich place. And to keep it easy, we have. What did you say? There's 15 or 16 people, I can't remember. And we have, say, either beef or fish. Sorry. They, you Happy can, vegetarian. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, and vegetarian, if you like. Um, but we did this because if you pick one of these, then I think we will also find funds to pay for it. <laughs> so the, the incentive is you go without <laughs> choice <laughs> and it doesn't cost anything. When you choose something else, then you have to sell a kidney. Uh, it's just because <laughs> they have, they're quite busy and so. You know, to make it easier, we just thought that's that's a start. What's the place? So it's uh, so we we'll, if people need directions to the place, if they want to go separately, um, just talk to us. <laughs> oh, otherwise we leave here at seven. So put it in. Yeah? So, <laughs> so yeah. So make it clear. So the if you choose one of these uh, two or three main courses, we'll pay that. But uh, the rest is up to you. So you yeah, can choose so anything else. Right. If you want starters or start desserts or drinks, drinks pro yeah. then you. That's what you guys have to see. Yeah, you wait until you see the prices in this place. It's very quiet. Oh, yeah, we went on Saturday. Yeah. Um, I'm a place in the Warehouse. Okay, so I'm going to pick up a song. Just to make my life more. It was so great.